sponsored by the James Madison Council and the National Endowment for the Arts. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Library of Congress National Book Festival. Uh, I'm Petra Mayer. I'm an editor with Impair Books, and I'm here today with Liz Hand and Alex Michaelides to talk about their books, um, respectively, The Book of Lamps and Banners and The Maidens. To learn more about them, you can actually check them out at loc.gov slash bookfest. Before I want, uh, excuse me, before we begin, I want to let you know that we're going to save the last 10 minutes of this half hour event to respond to audience questions. So please do su start submitting them now. Um, but actually, I'm going to kick off this fantastic event with the theme question for this year's festival. Uh, our theme is open a book, open the world. Um, certainly for me, opening a book opened an entire world to me when my dad weirdly gave me 1984, in 1984 when I was nine. But that just opened a whole world to me and now here I am. So I wanna ask you guys, uh, how have books opened the world for you? Um, jump in whoever wants to. Liz, go ahead. Oh, well, I think especially in the last year and a half, going on two years when uh, our chances to travel and, and see people have been limited. For me, books have, have been a lifesaver, um, just in terms of being able to be somewhere in, other than my own head and, and my own house <laughs> and my own backyard. Um, and I think that's a, an extension of, of what books do for us, um, most of us who are book lovers, uh, readers and writers, since childhood. You know, it, it exposes us to another place, another world, another person who is not us, sometimes another another species, another being. Um, to give Richard Powers the understory where uh, trees are, are characters and uh, novels where a place or setting can be almost a character in it. So um, for me, it's just, it's been really crucial for, for surviving and, and keeping my sanity during the pandemic. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, um, and you know, um, yeah, and also about childhood, I think specifically, I, uh, I grew up in Cyprus, which is a small island in the Mediterranean. And I just had, um, you know, I grew up before the internet, um, but I grew up in a house full of books. And my mum was a really avid reader. And all the books were kind of there before I was born. Um, and I think without that, I think I would have grown up really quite, you know, small-minded because as it was, I, I read about all these different countries, different cultures, you know, um, all these different kinds of stories. And I think it just expanded my mind um, in a really brilliant way. It's why it's so important to read when, and read widely when you're young, I think. Yeah, I think reading when one is young is so crucial. I mean, I saw, I have two kids who are both adults now, but... Um, seeing them and myself and and uh watching other children i know grow up into adults i, I think what happens with childhood reading because as, as a kid your exposure to the world is necessarily limited because you're a child uh your experience is limited and you may not be well traveled you may not know the world outside of your house or neighborhood but i think we are able to inhabit books in a way that we're not able to inhabit even the best movies or TV shows. And by doing that when you're a child, it sort of opens up this sense of, um, you know, the, the kind of uh, corny sense of wonder that you hear about a lot. But um, I think we take that with us when we go out and encounter the real world. The, the sense of wonder that we have reading books as kids, whether it's, you know, Tolkien or Anne of Green Gables or, you know, uh, E.L. Konensberg or what, you know, whatever young people are reading today. I think we get turned on to that in a way that we're able to take that out and, and carry it with us when we are older and we do finally go out in the world on our own. I warned you guys ahead of time that we were likely to get interrupted by one of my cats. And here's Godfrey. <laughs> He's very literary. <laughs> he wanted to come say hi. Did you have a question? <laughs> I love that whole point about sort of visiting other worlds, because especially if you're a baby geek like me, you learning about world building through sci-fi and fantasy, just opening up complete different worlds. That was just such a turning point in my life. Um, but I, I want to bring it back to your books. 
both of which open the door to worlds that are a little dark, I gotta say. Um, assuming our audience hasn't been lucky enough to read them, could you each tell me just a little bit about what's going on in your most recent books? Um, sure, um, I'll Alex, jump in first. Um, uh, uh, the Maidens is a, um, a psychological thriller, and you know it kind of has similar themes to my first book, Silent Patient, which is sort of a Greek tragedy and psychology and murder. Um, and it's about a kind of mysterious and charismatic um, Greek tragedy professor who's suspected of murdering his students at Cambridge University, um, who are all members of a secret society called the Maidens. And um, our heroine is a, uh, a troubled kind of group psychotherapist called Mariana, who becomes obsessed with proving the professor's guilt, um, even at, at the risk of endangering her own life. So kind of dark academia. So yes, kind of, kind of dark, I would say. This? Well, I love dark. <laughs> <laughs> my own taste, no, my own taste as a reader and and as a writer, both tend to skew dark, and um, uh, and I love dark academia as a as a genre, you know, like like your books and the secret history. I, I love books like that, um, but with uh, the Book of Lamps and Banners, which is the fourth in a continuing series of noir novels, psychological thrillers with a very damaged. Uh, proto-punk uh, protagonist named Cass Neary. Uh, the books were started, th that book was started, um, I can't remember what year, but uh, Brexit came down sh uh, shortly afterwards when I was immersed in it. And it's set in London, which is a place where I, before the pandemic, where I would live for part of the year because my um, partner is, ba is a UK citizen and is based there. So. I had to basically stop and reevaluate and ultimately rewrite the book to incorporate Brexit. And then when the 2016 election came um, and seeing the rise of, of white nationalists in uh, both the UK and the US, I had to sit down and rewrite the book again and sort of incorporate that into the backdrop and, and uh, a little bit more into the foreground as the book goes on. So. I think there was no way to avoid going dark, skewing dark with, with that sort of material. I think we were living in, in you know, and maybe still are in, in a dark time. It's a question, um, isn't it, when we are living in such a dark time as to why people enjoy reading dark stuff on top of it. <laughs> um, you know, I don't know the answer to that, but I do think about that. Yeah, yeah, I wonder I that too. a lot it's a too. Great question. Uh, earlier in the green room, we were talking about romance novels, which I like to read because they are a form of pleasant escapism when the world is dark. But, you know, maybe also there are people that like to be re reassured that things are dark all over or they like to see how other people deal with darkness. Sometimes in, in upsetting stories, we're working out the ways that we can deal with the darkness around us, I think. Mm -hmm. And unlike real life, at the end of... Um, the books, there is a resolution. So maybe that's it, you know. Yeah, and, and it imposes a sort of order uh, on a narrative, which we don't necessarily have in our own lives. Um, there is a resolution and even getting, even if, you know, it's a, um, talking about romance novels earlier, if, even if it's not a happy ending, it, you know, it is an ending of sorts. It, 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 you have a sense that somebody has been able to take this kind of chaotic material and have it make sense in a way that I think the real world does not, at least for me, always make sense. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Personally, I have to say that's what drives me nuts about a lot of what's commonly called literary fiction, although, you know, the, we can argue about the differences between literary and genre <laughs> and whether that's just a term that's useful in the bookstore, but like, some stories that I read are very interior and very open-ended and they like to end ambiguously. And I look at those stories and I think that happens in the real world. I don't need it here. <laughs> um, I, the other thing that came up while we were in the green room was that um, Liz, you said you had read Alex, were reading Alex's book. And that made me really excited because as I was reading, um, I read a couple of the Castanier books and as I was reading Maidens, I, I was sensing the kind of these commonalities between the main characters. They're both, women who are a little bit unreliable narrators, definitely damaged, a little bit prone to maybe seeing the supernatural. Um, so I wanted to ask how these characters came to each of you. 
Les, you go first. <laughs> well, um, <laughs> Cass Neary has a lot of autobiographical elements uh, in her. Um, I'm not as, you know, I, I'm not as screwed up as she is, certainly not now, but I was lucky in a way, I guess, that I was able to draw on a lot of the sort of darker material and experiences of my own life and, and um, use it in a way that was um, not exactly cathartic, but, but useful. I don't, I don't believe in writing as therapy, but I think that most writers uh, or many writers anyway, take elements from their own lives and use them in their fiction. And so that's what I did with Cass. So I sort of feel with her that I'm able to channel a lot of my own um, dark energy. She's sort of a, a secret sharer, although she has much more of an interesting life than I do. <laughs> yeah, and for me, in my case, you know, it's very similar actually. She is probably a bit more, um, messed up than I am, um, at least now. And um, she is a um, psychotherapist and she's also, um, you know, functions as a detective in the novel because she's trying to solve a murder, um, a series of murders. Um, but um, she's also a woman who's grieving, whose husband died a year ago. And she can't, is really struggling to deal with that despite her skills as being, you know, a therapist. Um, and, you know, it's, it's kind of weird. It's, it's, it's kind of murky process inspiration. You never really know where things come from. Um, and I just had this image, um, the very first image of Mariana was in her house in London, going through her husband's belongings and finding a pair of green, um, green sneakers. And that just stayed with me and it ended up being the first chapter in the novel. Um, and she grew from there, but she, she grew very much from a, just a, you know, like a, an image of, of someone. It's, it's an interesting um, process, I think. It's a really striking um, depiction of grief, too. It's, it's a really beautifully written opening chapter. And you wouldn't think, you know, if somebody were to tell you that this is the opening to a psychological novel. Here's this woman, this very interior scene when she's going through, when she finds the, the green shoes. And it, it, I thought it was really a tour de force. It was a very, very, oh, um, very Thank compelling you. scene and very, very beautiful, feel too. Do you feel, thank yeah. you, do you feel, you, tell me, I'm curious, you because I, I did find it was a really sad experience be, having living with a character like that for two and a half years, three years. Do, do you find that with your writing as well? Sad as in a bit you oh. know, mournful, I suppose. Yeah, with me, I don't, um, I don't know, but uh, maybe because she, Mariana is grieving that your experience of writing would, would leave you with sadness. With me, when I'm writing the cast books, it just is... Um, I do definitely feel impacted by it. I feel it, it's a very, you know, she's in a very dark place and she's a lot more desperate and despairing than I am. Um, not that I'm, you know, a Pollyanna, but uh, so I find it very difficult to be inside that person's head. And, it, and it's a first person narrative too, which I think, you know, it, it's something mm -hmm. that, uh, can, can be very um, challenging. It's kind of like acting in a way, I think. You know, I think of actors, we were talking earlier about Macbeth. What's it like to play Mac Lady Macbeth night after night? Um, and I think yeah. inhabiting these characters like, like yours um, or mine or others, uh, mm -hmm. I think it definitely does have an impact on us. It certainly does on me and you. you and that's, know, why like. the, that's why, as you said, there is an element of catharsis, I think, at the end of finishing it. You know, there, there definitely was for me, I think I was working through something while I was writing the book. And then when I finished it, I felt a lot lighter. It's interesting, Liz, what you say about Cass, because it struck me that she's grieving too, but she's not grieving a person. She's grieving the loss of, uh, of the scene that she came from and the life that she thinks she could have had. Because she's always talking about how she screws things up. She has an opportunity and she screws it up. And I feel like she's mourning a life that she could have had, but maybe doesn't even want, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I think that's really a, a, a really excellent way of describing her. It, you know, I, I've said in the past that she's sort of, she, when I was saying, talking about her being a secret chair, I've always pictured her as me if, you know, my brake lines had been cut when I was 21 years old, um, because she underwent some of the, with similar uh, difficult experiences that I did, but I came back from it. And writing those books, I thought about all right, a lot about, all right, what would it have been like if I had not come back from that? 
And if I had not had the life I have, if I hadn't been fortunate enough to have, you know, a supportive family and end up having a career doing something that I love. Um, and so to have her be so thwarted um, at such an, a young age, even though it was mostly her own self-sabotage, but, um, but she, she, I always, I think of her, she sort of almost comes out of suspended animation as the first book begins, because after 20 odd years of not doing, you know, working in the stock room at the Strand, she picks up her camera again and she basically, and she leaves New York City and, and heads out into the world. And, and it's a very different world than the one, even though she's not literally been in suspended animation, but she's, a, she's an analog person in, in a digital age, you know, she's, she's tied to her vinyl record. She's tied to her, um, film film camera as opposed to a digital camera and I think a lot you know I I feel a sort of um melancholy about the loss of that world too I, I think a lot of people my age do hmm. I mean she's very literally an analog person there are a bunch of scenes like, is it in the book of lamps and banners where she's talking about how she hates digital photography yeah yeah um so <laughs> the fact that she's a photographer um I found so interesting in terms of the storytelling because one thing that I like to ask writers is how is how does being a writer change the way that you move through and you see the world? Are you always looking at it in terms of story? And then Cass, of course, is also a visual storyteller, which is a whole different language. Like, so there are like multiple nested layers of storytelling. Um, has has living with that character changed the way you perceive the world? And, and that's a question for both of you, really. Yeah, Alex, why don't you feel that? first um has it i well you know it, it made me look very closely at a specific sort of moment in time and and um it's all set in cambridge you know and i was a student there 20 years ago and so i um decided to go back and research it and, and while i was writing the novel i, I spent um, several trips um for like you know a few days at a time um in cambridge in a hotel and i would take a little notebook and I thought the best way for me to rediscover the city was to walk through the novel from chapter to chapter, doing everything that Mariana was meant to be doing at the time she was meant to be doing it. Um, and what happened was really odd. So I'd be sitting in a pub at, you know, at 9.30, thinking it was going to be an atmospheric note-taking, and I'd be writing about the smells and the sounds, and I did all of that. But what also happened was that I started to um, be haunted in the way that Mariana is haunted by her past. I started to be haunted by myself at 18, and friends that I'd lost and lovers that I'd lost and places that I saw myself like a ghost, you know, sitting on a wall. Um, and it, it kind of really became a very internal experience. And I then managed to put all of that into the character and into the novel. So I think it's a really, um, it, you know, it, it does, it forces you to look outward, but also inward as well, I think, when you're writing a book. That's so interesting what you say about, about walking and, and retracing her steps and then having uh, the experience of, of writing it down and seeing it and tapping into your own, um, your own experiences. I, I, a lot of my work, um, th th those books, but others as well, are very much inspired by walking through landscapes, um, as fa un unfamiliar landscapes in particular, when I'm ever back when you know, one could travel. Uh, if I would be someplace that I had not been before, I would find it would always just um, put me very much on edge, even if it was a place that was very beautiful. I, I would almost feel something almost threatening about it. it Maybe even especially if it was in a place that was very beautiful. Uh, and, and I would find myself always kind of looking and maybe this is because this is just the way I think and what I write, but looking around and thinking like, where would be a good place to hide a body here? <laughs> or where would be a good place in this landscape for a, a protagonist to be walking along and see a body or, or come across a, a crime scene? But there's something about the, the kinetic action of, of walking um, yeah. somewhere. Yeah. And, and sometimes yeah. in a place where I've been before, like DC, um, and like you said, that was such, such a, a beautiful evocation of like, seeing you know the ghost of yourself there um i think it, i think that's a powerful tool for writing just the, the, the actual kinetic moment movement you're totally right it's i do it every day i i write and then i go and walk 
for like an hour. And then it's usually during, during the walk that the good ideas come, but you have to show up at the desk first. And then, you know, something about the, the freedom um, of the movement or something or just distracting yourself from thinking. I don't know how it works, but it, it always works. Yeah. yeah, it does. There's something kind of magical about it, I think. I, I do the exact same thing. I tell my students, um, I teach at an MFA program and also at, at, at writer's workshops, and I, I tell them all the time that really the best thing you can do for your writing is to go out and take a long walk, whether it's to break you know, a writer's block, or quote unquote writer's block, or whether it's just to, you know, uh, break up a scene, you know, if you're moving between scenes or characters or point of view. I, I just think it's one of the, the greatest things that one can do. Um, I have about 8 million more questions that I want to ask you, but we are actually <laughs> all out of time for us. It's time to move over to the questions from our audience. Um, uh, and I'm going to take a really long walk after this. And I'm you know, that was, <laughs> but I want to start with a question. I'm looking over here at my screen, so pardon me. A question from uh, Robert in the audience that I thought was really interesting. Um, he asks, everyone has different fears and psychological triggers that affect us differently. How do you know which psychological targets to hit when you're starting a new book? Ooh. Wow, I can't really? even, I need like 10 minutes to, to even think about how to yeah. answer that. Liz, you, 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 do, you do it for me. <laughs> That's a great question, Robert. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I, I guess a lot of that just, I'll be interested, Alex, in what you think. Um, a lot of it, I guess, just has to do with perhaps developing your character and their voice um, and finding out learning what would trigger them, which is not necessarily what would trigger me. Um, but yeah, that's that's a question that could really almost be a, an entire um, seminar in itself. Yeah. Alex? Yeah, I mean, definitely you want to, you know, it's it, it, in the sense of writing a genre piece, it's it's helped because you know there have to be, there has to be feelings of suspense and you know, fear and anxiety and all this kind of stuff. But I live with all of that anyway on a daily basis. So it's more about just finding a way to, as you said, to kind of tell the story through the eyes of the character. And then that, I think, brings you a lot of your material, you know, things that you want to hit when you're writing it. Sorry, I didn't mean to start with such a difficult question. It was just, it just it <laughs> no, jumped out great. at me. <laughs> this one maybe is a little bit more easy. This is from uh, Beatrice who asks, who are some of your favorite authors who write in the same dark genre style that you do? What are you reading right now? And with me, it's Ruth Rendell. I'm obsessed with her. I, I, I grew up obsessed with Agatha Christie and now I feel that I've kind of graduated to Ruth Rendell because she's just, um, you know, earlier also we were talking about literary novels versus genre novels. And it's, um, she is a, a, a brilliant literary writer who should have won the Booker Prize, but because she wrote crime, she was completely ignored in that sense. Um, and um, there's, I'm learning everything from her. She's just incredible. It's so, um, it's dark, it's brilliant, it's wry, it's funny, it's surprising, it's heartfelt, but it's also a genre piece. And so it's kind of teaching me, I think, what, what I would like to aspire to be, to kind of make these novels as good as I can and not just like, you know, fast, quick, kind of take, take away reads. Um, if that makes sense. Oh, yeah. I love Ruth Rendell too. She, I, she's brilliant. She's definitely one of my my very favorite writers, and I always learn new things from her. You know, her mm -hmm. her and Barbara Vine. <laughs> her yeah, I love Barbara writing. Vine massively. When yeah. she's writing as her, which is incredible. Yeah. Yeah, but um, but Ruth Rendell, Demo Daphne Du Maurier, uh, who I think doesn't always get um the credit she's due as being kind of an iconoclastic writer. Um, Kate Atkinson and Tana French, who I think are are really um, wonderful. I love Kate Atkinson's books because they don't, you know, they don't really follow um, uh, the traditional conventions of a thriller or a procedural. They they go completely off on these weird tangents and things. But I, I just I find them really, really fascinating. Um, so yeah, but there's many others now. That's one of those questions that I can never. Yeah. After I, you know, I always think of the other answers after we go. I, I love Du Maurier as well. I mean, she's such a. 
she, she's incredible because there's so much atmosphere and so much romance and yet at the same time you're in a really capable suspense writer's hands and so there's there's so much to her to learn from as well um, i feel like i'm getting lots of great book recommendations from this conversation too because honestly i haven't read a lot of thrillers this is this is a new experience for me all the way around <laughs> so i'm gonna go read some ruth rendell right now um you, we have one Rendell. more question um, and I feel like this maybe is also uh, a good place for some book recommendation. This is from Kevin. Uh, he says, if one is a beginner writer interested in psychological thrillers, how would you suggest we go about learning to write? Which is pretty broad, but I always tell people to read if they want to learn how to write. So maybe some more book recommendations? Before I wrote The Silent Patient, I read um, Patricia Highsmith's um, book, um, How to Write Suspense Fiction, like five times in a row. Um, and I took so much from that, you know, like even basic things, like she says, there must be a sense of unease constantly. And, there and then she says, the threat of violence must never be far away. And you shouldn't have too many pages without something kind of weird and creepy happening. Even stuff like that, I didn't know. And I was like, okay, that's good. I can do that. I can do that. So I recommend um, you read that book, um, How to Write Suspense Fiction. Patricia Highsmith is incredible. Yeah, I, I too re have read that book when I was starting out writing psychological thrillers and, and yeah, it's very useful. I I have to say, I am not a big one for how-to books with writing. Um, I, I even though I teach writing, creative writing, I, I, have, I don't know that writing can really be taught, but I think, you know, I think it can be learned and encouraged. And I think the way we, we do that is by reading. So I would say any of the writers that we mentioned in this conversation, if you want to write psychological thrillers would be a great place to start. Um, uh, who, who, except for you, Alex, I think are all have all been women writers. Um, yeah. But- They write um, much better crime women. It's a really interesting thing. I think it's true though. Yeah, I think women may perhaps be more um, experienced with, uh, or more more familiar with the experience of, of feeling threatened <laughs> than than men are, and I think because of that, that may give us, um, you know, a certain uh, edge in, in writing stories like that. But I would say just read read widely. I think people, you know, you can't you really can't read too much, um, and. Uh, Immerse yourself in the works of a writer who you know has withstood the test of time, somebody like Ruth Randall or Demolier, but, but also new writers, you know, Tana French, um, she, she does really, really interesting things uh, in her work and has, you know, some flickers of the um, supernatural in it, which I always think is really interesting to, to find in, um, into quote unquote realistic fiction, yeah. straight fiction. We're almost out of time, uh, but I just want to wind up with uh, asking both of you, um, what's next, if it's not too soon to ask? <laughs> Liz, what are you writing next? I'm in the throes of finishing um, the final revision on a, um, a thriller, a supernatural psychological thr thriller uh, that will be out next year called, called Hokuloa Road, which is set um, in Hawaii. And so it's very different for me because it's it's got a, a setting that's not cold. <laughs> it's not cold and dark. So um, so that's different. And, and I found it kind of unsettling. <laughs> it sounds great. Coming from Maine. <laughs> <laughs> So um, it's scary, scary stuff is scarier huh? when it's in the bright, cheerful sunshine, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. Um, I'm setting, I'm writing a, a thriller set on a Greek island. Um, so that's a lot of, that's an experience for me to walk up and down, excuse for me to walk up and down the beach and pretend that I'm working. Um, but I am, in case my editor is watching, I am actually working. Um, <laughs> we won't tell on you. You're working. You know. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, so yeah, we are basically out of time. Um, thank you so much, Liz Hand and Alex Michaelides, um, for sharing your time and your work with us so generously. And thanks to the audience for all of your great questions. Um, and you can keep enjoying events at the National Book Festival if you go to loc.gov slash bookfest. Um, 
I'm Petra with NPR Books, and thank you all again for joining us. Thank you, Petra and thank Alex. You. Thanks for having us. It was really lovely talking this to you. It's really been a great conversation. Yeah, I enjoyed wonderful. It and I'm going to go Delightful. definitely read some. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>